James Rodriguez, Edinson Cavani, Luis Suarez. Just a few of the names linked with a move to Inter Miami, but it is Gonzalo Pipita Higuain who arrives to wear number nine for the Herons. I'm Eric Krakauer. This is Miami Total Football Radio. And apologies for the extended absence. All will be explained, but not before welcoming in Inter Miami insider Franco Penizo, who had a little insect problem uh, during one of his last <laughs> team videos. Franco, how are you doing? I'm good. There's no bugs uh, where I'm at right now. I'm inside, so no no bugs flying on my head right now. Even if there was, no one can see us, so it's all good. But definitely an interesting learning experience for me. I know you do a lot of video, a lot of uh, TV programming, and, and this is, for me, this you know I'm still getting used to the whole video. And um, for me, I know I'm not live, so I could have touched my face and redone what I was doing. But I was like, let's get used to not touching your face and, and not creating those habits. So I just let this bug fly onto my head. I, I posted on Twitter if anyone has no idea what we're talking about or hasn't seen it. It's 10 seconds long. I'm, I'm in the middle of talking about Breck Shea's header, and this bug flies on top of my temple and sits there for a couple seconds, and then I try to header it off. Um, kind of funny but um yeah i mean it's, it's good it's good that we're back on like you said it's been a while since we've been able to to get on and, and obviously we've wanted to get on a consistent uh tempo consistent regular basis but it's been difficult not only with the mls schedule kind of being stop start or three games in a week but also just with like the timing of news and the timing of things that are happening we don't want to get we don't want to give a show and put out a show that in a day or two is completely dated so we've tried to figure out the right time it's been difficult but we're going to try to get back on a on a more consistent basis soon once we know the full schedule of the season which should come out Tuesday tomorrow Tuesday the the remaining MLS regular season schedule should come out for Inter Miami so Hopefully, from there, me and Eric can can uh, can can map out how we can get the show going back on a, on a weekly basis, once a week, so everyone knows when to expect it and and when it's coming. Because I know there's some people on Twitter that were like, "Finally, we get another show." I I, I know. At least at least we have some faithful uh, followers. Hey, just uh, just count yourself lucky that you didn't say "creativity" on uh, <laughs> l- live television. You got you got, uh, man, you, got, you, got to tell, you got to tell the listeners that like whoever has, well, whoever's not watching BN Sports, whoever missed that for for their unlucky reasons, you have to share the story before we jump into anything. Well, who's not watching BN Sports? Number <laughs> one, number two. Uh, every Sunday, I'm on the Soccer Extra. We review the the weekend, and, and I was trying to uh, say creativity, but at the same time as I was about to say the word. I heard my producer in my ear count me down from five, which meant that we had to move on. And I got totally distracted. Instead of creativity, I said creativity. So I think uh, you handled the bug a little bit better. <laughs> and just to add to the points that you were making about the scheduling and the fact that we haven't recorded the pod in a while, um, I'm also a culprit here uh, covering Copa Libertadores, which has restarted um, South America's Uh, premier club competition, international club competition. Uh, It's kept me very, very busy. So finding a time to record this pod has been a little bit difficult as of late, but we promise you guys uh, that we will fix that. Okay, we spent enough time on that, and we mean to have a a brief pod today. Uh, We're going to give you all the latest on Gonzalo Higuain, a brief recap on the loss to Orlando and the win in Atlanta. Uh, perhaps the best 45 minutes we've seen from Inter Miami in the first half. Plus, we'll answer some of your questions, even though you have taken some liberties by asking multiple questions in a single tweet. <laughs> so let's get to it. <laughs> Gonzalo Higuain is finally, finally an official Inter Miami player. We have pictures and video and an interview uh, of him in Inter Miami colors, and you have been covering uh, his story before his arrival, since his arrival. So, what's the latest on Iguain? And everybody out there is asking whether we are going to see him on Wednesday against the Red Bulls. Which I must say, Franco, it needs to be mentioned. I think we've mentioned it before multiple times, but I'm going to say it once again: is where we met <laughs> in that stadium, Red Bull Arena, when we were. Uh, covering that team, but on to Iguain. Yeah, so Iguain has obviously, like people have seen by now, is training on an individual basis. He's still not doing group training. 
has to go through a mandatory quarantine period just like Blaze Matuidi did because he hasn't been subject to regular COVID testing. So that's a 10-day to 14-day period. I was I was told by people in the club that it started, his 10-day or 14-day quarantine period started as soon as he arrived. So that's, we're talking two Thursday nights ago or two Fridays ago, if you want to start from the day he would be able to participate in training. So two Fridays ago, it was when the countdown began, even though he hadn't officially signed or that's when the countdown began. So his quarantine period should be up by this end of this week, if not a little bit before, we're talking midweek. So there is a chance he could be eligible to play Wednesday or the Sunday in the Philadelphia Union match. However, it's not just the quarantine period that they're working through right now. That it, the team's also trying to get his visa situation sorted. And that you know can take time, and it, it fluctuates depending on just different circumstances. So I think that I think that's what they're still working. I think that's more of the the, the holdup or, or what might prevent him from playing as soon as this week. I I would wouldn't rule it out. I think it's a it's definitely a possibility, but I think it's a slim possibility, especially Wednesday. I think Wednesdays. Too short of a turnaround, um, given that they're still working on the visa process. So I, I would expect him not to play this week. I think just me reading between the lines and the vibe I've been getting is just I don't think it's going to happen this week. I think they're still trying to cross some T's and, and dot some I's. I'm glad I said that correctly. Um, and <laughs> and, uh, and I, I think maybe it'll, it might be another week or so before before he can officially partake in games, but that doesn't mean that he won't be able to officially join the team in training. Maybe he can do that by the end of this week, pass his quarantine period, and f- officially join full team training. So something to keep an eye on, something that's still developing, but obviously it's it's getting closer and closer, and obviously Inter Miami needs that because even though they're playing better, they, st- they still need goals, and they still need that, that prolific and, and clinical goal scorer up top. One of the things that struck me when I saw pictures of uh, Iguain in the... Uh, pink training jersey and those black shorts was how fit he actually looked. This is a player who throughout his career was often criticized for being overweight. Uh, Not the case. He looks like he is arriving sharp. And that is good news for Inter Miami because, of course, as you have just noted, it's going to be um, some time for him to, it's going to take some time for him to, to get involved and actually get into the game. Although, not that long. It's just that games are coming thick and fast right now for, for Inter Miami, and that's why perhaps it will feel uh, like l- much longer than it actually is. And seeing the way that he looks right now, I know you're not supposed to judge a book by its cover, he should hit the ground running. And considering the way that Inter Miami have been playing better with a more uh, pronounced game plan, particularly going forward, this is good news for Inter Miami. I think this is this is a move. You look at their roster now with this guy leading the line, and you think this is a team that can cause some damage once everything is sort of gelling. I'm I'm curious to see what our listeners think about the images of him training and the pictures and the video of him training and what they think of you know how he looks coming into his time with Inter Miami. Because I actually got a couple of texts and a couple of messages from. People that follow MLS, people that work in MLS that were saying the opposite of what you just said, that, that he doesn't look that fit, that the shirt he was wearing is a size maybe bigger than what he normally wears, and maybe that's to cover up, uh, you know, so may, maybe if he is overweight to help cover up some some of that. So, uh, like, for me, I, I, I don't know, man. I, I, can't, I couldn't tell if he's, like, in shape or not. Like, the shirt is definitely bigger on him than, than – it's not a fitted shirt. It's not a fitted top, so – uh, I don't know if he's in, in prime condition or he's coming into this in his peak physical condition, which is obviously a, a talking point that's, that's been going well with him throughout his career. And it, it kind of reminded me of when Chicharito was uh, playing with, with LA Galaxy at MLS's back. He was wearing like a big of, a bit of a, a looser jersey, and then there was a little bit of talk of, is he in shape? Is he, is he come into this in, in top physical condition, or is he, is he a little bit overweight? So I, I, I'm not sure. We'll see. Once Iguain is able to play and able to to show what he's got, I think then we'll be we'll have our answers solved. Unless someone gets a picture of him, you know, with his shirt off on South Beach somewhere. But yeah, I, 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 regardless, I think he's going to bring the goals. I think he's going to score goals. It, it, it's I don't think it's a matter of of if. Or I, I don't I think it's, it's just it's it's going to happen. Like he's going to come here. He's going to score goals. He is 
probably the, the, the most talented player in the entire league. He definitely has the best pedigree in, in the entire league. So I definitely expect him once to once he arrives to score goals. It's just I'm very curious to see what happens in terms of the high pressing that Inter Miami likes to do, that Diego Alonso likes his team to adopt. Because I don't know how much Iguain at this point in his career, whether he's in his top physical condition or not, is gonna be that type of player that's gonna be able to to run about and really press opposing center backs and, and do a lot of the dirty running as some teams call it. So I think that and I asked Diego Alonso about that a couple of weeks ago before the official announcement was made and he said he said he would love to answer the question but that now was not the time to discuss that he didn't he didn't elaborate as to why but reading between the lines it's more of the sense that hey he's not officially our player yet so he didn't want to comment but sooner or later we'll be able to ask Diego Alonso about about Iguain and I fully intend to ask him that question about how he fits their style of play from a pressing standpoint because I think that's going to be an interesting wrinkle or an interesting detail to, to, to dissect and to see how, how Inter Miami approaches that. I would encourage anybody out there who thinks that he is arriving out of shape to look at what he looked like when he first signed for Juve and joined the old lady. He was twice the size. Uh, and the one thing that you can always tell about Iguain uh, about what, what kind of shape he's in is his stomach. Because when he's not in shape, it pops out. <laughs> so uh, I, I don't care how big the shirt was, uh, even that that uh, that picture that was posted by Moss at the at the airport. Uh, he looked slim, and, and that is uh, certainly uh, good news. But we're going to move on, and we're going to talk about the games against Orlando and Atlanta. Well, before we do next. that, before we do that, before we do that, before we go quickly, I just want to I want because like the, the big talking point has been. His salary, right? Like, and, and supposedly he's going to oh, be. that's a good point. That's he's going to be. The, he's going to be the highest paid player in MLS, reportedly, right? We don't have the figures yet. The MLS Players Association hasn't printed them out, hasn't put them out yet, like they like they normally do multiple times throughout the year. Most likely because of the COVID situation and 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 the the pay cuts that have gone into that um, to this year because of everything that's transpired. This is uh, th- we can close on this, and I, I want to ask you this question because I've had this conversation informally and formally with with colleagues and just friends and people that follow the team. What will consider him a successful signing what what does he need to do to be okay Miami got their money's worth and again it's worth seven to eight million dollars a season he's supposed to be getting so taking that into consideration those are reported figures nothing confirmed but taking that into consideration what do you think he needs to do to be considered a successful signing because he's going to score goals it's a matter like how much what how far into Miami goes Oh, well, first of all, he's going to have to score in double j- digits. I, I think that's one metric. Number two, he's going to have to uh, make Inter Miami much more competitive. Do I think that they need to win a trophy in order for him to be considered a success? No. Just look at David Villa at NYCFC. He'll be he'll always be considered a success right. uh, by 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 everybody. He didn't win any silverware with the club, but he was the difference maker. Uh, when the going got tough. He got going. Excuse the the cliche. He would. Pull Diego, that's something. a Diego Alonso cliche. Actually, he's used that in Spanish. <laughs> Has he really? Yeah. Oh, well, there yeah. you go. Uh, great minds think alike. <laughs> um, but but he's the kind of guy who who delivered for NYCFC when the team wasn't playing well. And we have seen Inter Miami not play well. And we've seen Pizarro, for example, try to grab games by the scruff of the neck, but not making it happen sometimes. Uh, Gonzalo Higuain is going to have to be that guy. He's going to have to be the guy who's going to be able to to have a moment of of magic. Uh, so I hope that answers your question. What do you think? Uh, I think he's going to, like I said, I, he's going to score goals, right? So that's like that's not even a question. It's just a matter of how, like, can you quantify how much he needs to score? I, I don't think there needs to be an exact number. He has a two and a half year contract, but I don't know how if you can put throw an exact number and be like he has to hit this number to be considered a success. I would disagree with you and say that he needs to score in double figures, but not not we're not talking ten eleven. I'm, I, he needs to score twenty plus in in the full seasons that he's around. Not this season. This season he's going to be here for less than half a season, and then he's still got to get his feet underneath him and get settled off the field, and all those things play into play into a player being able to fully show what they have on the field. Um, it's not you know some people don't take that into consideration. It's not a video game. You like. You have to be settled off the field to be fully capable to show what you have on the field. So uh, this season, 
it's you know what he can bring, what he can add. You know that's that's the plus. Going forward, I think he needs to score twenty goals a season, and I do think they need to win a title. This is so compared to NYCFC. Obviously, NYCFC spent money initially when they came out. They had Villa, they had Lampard, they had Pirlo, but they didn't come with the the, the ambition or at least the public. Dialogue expectations. Of, correct of of David Beckham's. You're always one of your owners, and you've talked about wanting to win MLS Cup by the second season and become you know one of the become one of the most or the most important team in this hemisphere using Jorge Mas's words, owner Jorge Mas's words. So I think they do do need to win a trophy. Does it need to be MLS Cup? Not necessarily, but I think they need to win a trophy. Whether it's the U.S. Open Cup when when and if that resumes next year, or a Supporter Shield. I don't think his stint can end trophyless, and then you can fully say that this was a success, especially given how much they're paying him and the team that he's on with the ambitions that they've set. I, I think there has to be a tr- there has to be goals, and there needs to be at least one trophy somewhere in there. But that's just that's just my my barometer. Maybe I maybe I've, I'm setting the bar high. I don't know. Curious to hear what our listeners think, and and, and I welcome them to give us feedback. Obviously, we we ask for feedback on the show, but you know, anytime you have feedback just about anything we talk about, just let hit us up on Twitter, either at our personal Twitter handles or at Miami Total Football, M I A Total Football. So definitely would love to hear what you guys think uh, with regards to to Iguain and what he needs to do to be deemed a successful signing. So you are judging him. By the ambitions of the club, absolutely. Ultimately, that's that's, absolutely. that's what you're doing. Absolutely, okay. absolutely. He's they brought him on board, and they're they're saying, you know, he's we brought him on board because he's that number nine that has the pedigree, that's played at the top clubs in the world, that's played for Argentina's national team. He's a World Cup finalist. We, we're the only team with two World Cup finalists on the roster, so they're they're completely aware and they're completely selling the point that he is well they're also probably the best they, probably the best player in the well, league just you could, you could make that argument just look at look at, you know his brother who has been one of my favorite players in mls dominated midfields uh, while at the columbus crew and he isn't half the player that gonzalo Higuain is gonzalo Higuain is is a phenomenal phenomenal player let's not forget that this is a guy who was the most frequent um, with Cunaguero, the most freq- frequent strike partner for Lionel Messi in the Argentine national team. And unfortunately, he gets, you know, the knives pointed at him because he missed, you know, a chance to score in the World Cup final, a couple of them as well in the uh, Copa America 2015 and the Centenario in, in 2016. But he is a phenomenal, phenomenal player. I think he will show up. Whether Inter Miami will win trophies, that's a whole different matter. And as for that ambition, uh, the, 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 the grandiosity that is being imagined by those people uh, who, who run the club, I think part of that too has to do uh, with, with marketing, right? Well- yeah, of you're, you're selling a brand, and you can only sell a brand if you are pushing that brand as a winner. Because nobody likes nobody likes losers, right? Just ask Chivas USA. Of course, okay. <laughs> of course, of course. But again, but then that's that's gonna that's gonna also help set expectations. And of course, you know, and of that's course. I mean that's that and that's and I like I don't, I don't we don't need to go too much more into it because we've talked about it on multiples, but that's. That's what Inter Miami has been selling. They've been talking about being this this top team in the league and establishing themselves as, as a team that pushes the envelope and raises the bar for everyone else. And in order to do that, you need to compete for trophies and eventually win one. And that's that's the the barometer they're setting for themselves by setting these expectations and talking about these type of signings and pushing them the way they are. And, and look, Diego Alonso has said this, and I, and I know you know you're caught up with with BN a lot, and but I'm doing the day to day with Inter Miami, and Diego Alonso has said this repeatedly, and I'm going to quote him verbatim, and then we can close it out on this. But he has said in Spanish repeatedly, "I am not here to coach a team to win games. Like that, that's easy. That's not that doesn't that doesn't take too much difficulty. I'm here to coach a team to win titles, and that's what I'm here for." So their, their talk is, regardless if it's marketing or not, the belief from within is that they're, they're building a team that's going to compete for titles. And they need to, they need to compete for titles. I absolutely think in an MLS, in a league where the, all, the most of your money goes to attacking spots, 
that and Gonzalo Higuain's obviously being paid a, a hefty and a pretty penny that they absolutely need to compete and win a title, one title over the next two and a half seasons for his signing to be deemed a success. All right, let's talk about the two games that were played since we last reported, since we last recorded a, a pod on the other side. Right, Franco, the last time we recorded the pod, it was just before Inter-Miami traveled to Orlando where they lost 2-1. And of course, a couple of days ago, they beat Atlanta United at Mercedes-Benz. We're not going to focus so much on the games themselves because, you know, they're in the past and far enough in the past where I don't think we need to dissect them. But I think we should talk about some of the storylines from from those games. And I think that the first storyline is Breck Shea, a player whose goal scoring uh, you you once uh, described as invisible as the <laughs> wind. Well, funny enough, he's scoring goals and having an impact on this team. He scored against Orlando. He scored the winner against Atlanta. What do you make of his meteoric rise in south florida so i said his end product is was as invisible as the wind and i and like that that meant goals yes and that that also meant his his, his crossing right now i'm eating crow breck Shea has completely surpassed what i thought he would be this season and i think it's only going to get better because he's talked about it he's not at 100 percent yet he's not he's not where he wants to be in terms of sharpness and in terms of his physical uh, abilities because he's coming off an injury, a knee injury, a, a very serious knee injury that took him out uh, out of action for 15 months, a year and three months. So he's still working his way back to his best. And even so, with every game he gets, with every minute he gets on the field, he's showing more and more of what he's capable of doing. He has scored in back-to-back games, both headers, and he looks like He's enjoying himself out there. He said in, on the most recent call, he's having fun. And you, you're starting to see a little more of maybe the Breck Shea. And, and I know with Atlanta, he was showing good things as a left wing back. But now he's, he's playing a little bit more as a left midfielder. And you're seeing maybe a little more of the older Breck Shea that was more direct and more capable of, of getting forward and whipping in. Uh, a, a heavy dose of, of good crosses. Uh, he had the one cross against Orlando City. Uh, and obviously, the goal was a big talking point, but he had that one cross in the game against Orlando City that led to a penalty kick call on VAR before it got negated by further deliberation after the VAR call was made. So, he, Breck Shea has been playing well. Diego Alonso has talked highly about what he's given them and how he's gotten into the into the fold and into the fray and he's been a good signing for them a good mid-season signing for them and it, 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 maybe he, he he's going to bring that verticality and i've written this at sbisoccer.com he's going to maybe he can bring that verticality at the left midfield spot that inter miami has been missing for much of this year they've they obviously went with matias pellegrini for much of these first you know t- eight nine ten games or so and matias struggled and he wasn't able to bring that dimension to that side of, of the attack kind of made inner miami's attack unbalanced because they could only essentially attack down the right side consistently through lewis morgan and the crosses he would whip in but now if you can get breck shea going and and continue to tap into these type of performances and get him to produce these type of performances out there on the left then that just opens up the whole thing for for everybody in the attack so breck shea's done very well as of late I'd expect him to get more minutes and more time as he continues to work his way back to 100%. Definitely been uh, a good signing and a, and a productive one as of late. He seemed confident from the word go when this guy 
was playing in Miami Colors. Uh, taking people on the dribble, trying difficult passes. I'm happy that things are working out for him. Uh, he looks like a player who's enjoying his football, and if you're enjoying your football or your soccer, you're going to perform well, and that is infectious. So everybody else uh, will step up their game as well. And speaking of stepping up their games, Juan Agudelo, who uh, had a, a couple of decent games in, in the beginning of his Inter-Miami uh, career, scored a goal in the bubble, and now in Atlanta scores the opening goal against Atlanta United. This is a guy who's giving Diego Alonso something to think about, not only as his versatility worked in his favor, which is in contrast to what I believe um, has happened throughout his career, mm -hmm. where not having a nailed-on position made him a little bit of a, just a, a, a stopgap more than an actual starter. But now we're seeing that Diego Alonso is figuring out how to use him in different positions, and he's coming good. Yeah, I think Juan Agudelo, and I know we have a couple of listeners, including Eric, uh, not not Eric, you, but a different Eric, that does not rate Agudelo and has given me stick for writing articles about him and, and, and you know comments that Diego Alonso has made and and presenting him at one point as a potential option to start out on the left because he was he started he started to show well there but like you said in terms of his versatility I agree with you that I think that's been kind of uh, a mark against him throughout his career it hasn't allowed him to really thrive because he hasn't been able to stick stick in one spot but right now with Inter Miami it's working whatever Diego Alonso is doing is working and and this is something important and I didn't get to ask him and I, and I regretted not asking him during this weekend's conference call he was, he was him and Brexia were the two players that spoke he I think he's the first player and it, let me let me do, do a quick parenthesis he scored the fastest goal in, in inter Miami history he beat Rodolfo Pizarro's goal by a few seconds from week two against DC United so he had, he's, he set that mark with his goal against Atlanta United but I think he's the first player to kiss the crest as a celebration and that to me that to me that says something of a player and what he feels towards the club and if he and if my memory serves me correctly and I don't think anyone else has done it to this point then maybe just where he is and or how the co how the team's working or how, how things are being run just is conducive and and helping him thrive because before this performance, and I think it was his best performance of the year, not only because of the goal, but just his hold-up play, his the way he, he held the ball with his back to goal, his combination play, he moved the ball really well. Across the board, I thought he had a very, very good game. And before this, he, was, he, he started getting some looks out on the left side of the midfield, and he was also starting to do well there. I think it was the game against Nashville that that ends zero zero here in Fort Lauderdale, where he helps create Inter Miami's four best chances in that match. So whatever whatever Diego Alonso is doing in terms of Juan Agudelo, it's it's working. And I know Juan Agudelo also also was, you know he's talked about the fan base and and feeling. I don't know if at home is the right word, but he he definitely feels that 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 passion. And I he explained it during that video that that made the rounds and went viral back in week one when the team was jumping around with the fans outside of the hotel in LA the day before the game. He said he kind of started that whole thing because he heard the fans and it just kind of got to him and it kind of like it impacted him. Like, hey man, look at these, this is awesome. And he started jumping up and down, and then everybody else kind of joined in and it made for this very cool and very sweet moment. So I think he's playing very well. As of late, I do think that he either either he's going to be a rotation type of starter out on the left, or he'll just be the the, the main backup at striker once Iguain is cleared and once Iguain gets going because you're not, you're not going to expect him to start over Iguain. So then it's it's the left the left mid spot is the one spot that's kind of still up for grabs between maybe him Brexia. You could throw Matias Pellegrini back in the mix if if he can raise his form. So. But definitely a good weapon to have, either off the bench or in spot starting duty. He, I think he's played really well, and I think he's really enjoying himself as well with Inter Miami and what the team and, and the environment that he has is, is, is giving him and asking of him. He'll also have an opportunity now. I know that it kind of sucks in a way because he's winning his position, and now here's a superstar arriving, and his minutes are going to dwindle at least in so far as the center forward position. Maybe, is maybe that's pushing him too. Maybe that's pushing him to like you well, know right. What I was going to say is what I was going to say is he's 27 years old. 
a world class striker is arriving. He can only he can only learn from from Gonzalo Higuain, and he's obviously got that versatility, and he obviously did well on the left hand side. And Pellegrini hasn't convinced, and Breck Shea is is probably not going to be an everyday or every week starter. So he he will get minutes given what he has. Um, provided for for this team, and it, you know, and to the point, really quickly about kissing the badge, the the viral video. We said from from the the very first pod that you and I re- recorded, or at least I made this point. There was something quite interesting about what was happening in Miami in terms of fan culture, the 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 viewing parties. Obviously, all of this w- interrupted by. By, by COVID. Mm-hmm. Um, we've even seen it during COVID and you and I have spoken about it and I've been critical when people were showing up at the, at the stadium for the send offs, the send off for the players, uh, for the bubble. Um, it's just too dangerous as far as, uh, as far as I was concerned. Uh, I continue to believe that to be the case, but the silver lining is th- there has been, and, and perhaps this is also credit to, you know, what, what the ownership of the club has done, with with promoting this team as uh, a big brand as as a winner, well, they've galvanized a, a, a fan groups here. They've galvanized supporters, and that is infectious. Yeah. Okay. And Agudelo is obviously a player that is benefiting from it. Uh, yeah. Very quickly, Franco, I'm going to ask you this question. Um, well, I wanna, try not to. Before, before you, yeah, before you ask that, I want to I want to touch on this because obviously we haven't had a show um, for a couple of weeks, and and this is something that I experienced and I lived and I want to share it with with the listeners. I was I, I I did go to Orlando to cover the game up in uh, or Exploria Stadium, the Inter Miami Orlando City game. The Inter Miami lost two to one just now. I was the only reporter from from the South Florida market from the Inter Miami beat that went, and it was awesome to see fans. In the stadium in general, just even though it wasn't at capacity. But before the game, I spent some time with Vice City. I went to their pregame tailgate, chatted with a few of the fans, saw how they did things. I took some video. I I put up a video on YouTube on it. And, I mean, the passion that they exude and that they're so bought into this team. And a, a lot of Vice City is... Miami based, you know, the, the, not not really not necessarily Fort Lauderdale or 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 West Palm uh, or Broward, sorry, Broward or, or West Palm, and they're mostly Miami based, and they brought it, man. They brought it not only during the pregame tailgate where they like they had a barbecue and they gave me they they let me have a, a, a Argentine grilled chorizo with chimichurri on on a piece of bread. It was ridiculously good. But, like, they brought it, man. They brought it. Like, my sister that lives in Orlando, my half-sister that lives in Orlando, she ended up sitting with them in their section. She got a ticket from someone that had a spare ticket, and she ended up sitting with them. And you could see in the stadium that they brought it. They were in a corner of the stadium, and they they just brought it, man, for 90, for 90 minutes. And there were other Inter-Miami supporters groups there. The, the Siege was there, and Southern Legion was there. I think the Siege was in a different part of, of the stadium, and I think Southern Legion, some of them were in the same section that Vice City was in. But, man, they, they just brought it, man. It was, it was awesome to see that passion in the stands again. It had been so long since, since week one that, that we hadn't had a chance to see that. There were some fans at DC United. I didn't go to that, to that game but in week two, but it was just awesome, awesome to see fans in the stands. Hopefully, hopefully they'll be, they'll be able to open the doors at, for, at Inter-Miami CF Stadium, and, and you'll be able to see a little bit more of that because it was just refreshing, man. Really refreshing to see, to, to see that up close and personal again after so many months of just empty stadium uh, or fanless games. Yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing uh, fans in the stands in, in person and going to the stadium and, and meeting all of you. Uh, all of you who write the hate mail. Um, <laughs> so I'm looking forward to that. Look, I was going to ask you a question that was going to require about a, a minute or two of an answer, but I'm going to you, – you have about 15 to 20 seconds. Some people have described the first half against Atlanta United as the best half of football that Inter-Miami mm-hmm. have played uh, since they basically came into existence. Do you agree or not? <laughs> Um, I fully agree that there was the best half of, of soccer in terms of just their build up and their attacking soccer. And there's something I wanted to say earlier when we were talking about yeah, time's up. No, no, no. I'm That's kidding. not even fifteen. I'm that kidding. was like no, eight. No, no. There's something that has to be taken into consideration and said um, when it, you know when I was talking about Agadello. The team they were playing, Atlanta United, is a team in transition, a team that didn't have a difference maker on the field and is going through a rough patch. So 
their level of the opposition wasn't necessarily the highest, so that has to be taken into consideration. But yes, this was absolutely their best half of soccer. They've been showing progress, but this was the one half they really pieced it together. Not only did they get two early goals, they created a bunch of chances. I think they finished the first half with 10 shots, four on target, and they had two other goals that they scored waved off because of narrow offsides. Absolutely their best half of soccer. Something to build on, something to, to try to emulate going forward. And I'll add this really quickly. I think, and I'm not able to think about it too much because I know I'm under, under time to crunch here. I think they're 2-1-2 two, two in their last five games. So two wins, one, one loss, and two draws. So they're making progress. And they Things should, they are go looking further. up yes, is, yes. is what you're saying. Yes. All right, go put some ice on your jaw. And uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll, in our next segment, we will answer a few of your questions. Okay, question and answer time. And uh, Jay Reed, who has asked questions before, taking some liberties here and <laughs> and uh, bringing me up. So uh, I'll read his questions, and then Franco, you start answering them. Uh, remember that time is limited here. Uh, okay, here <laughs> I'll try goes. to do better many, here. I'll try to do better here. How many roster spots are available? Question mark. Do you see any more moves before the window closes? Question mark. I'm. I'm doing the question mark so you could tell that it's more than one question. <laughs> Any more information on a young DP spot for next year? Question mark. Can Agudelo keep his form? Question mark. I know, Eric, I'm asking a lot of questions. LOL. So four to be exact. <laughs> uh, do you even remember them? Franco, go. Start answering them. Um, so as far as the roster goes, I don't have the exact number right here in front of me. I'd have to, I'd have to think. They obviously made some roster moves. They sent... Jerome Kiesvetter, your your boy that you've been high on, they sent him uh, as well as I'm blanking, I'm blanking, I'm blanking. Who who else did they send? Macoon. Uh, um, Christian Macoon. Yes, they sent they sent both both of them to Fort Lauderdale CF, the USL affiliate, on a season long loan essentially. But they're uh, they're able to recall them at any time, at any point. So they could come back on the first team roster. So that's two roster spots that are open. They also waived Luis Argudo a couple of weeks ago. And so that's another roster spot that's open. They've, they're they going to fill one with Gonzalo Higuain, or they filled one with Gonzalo Higuain. I think that leaves you with, again, roughly one or two spots on the, on the squad for the remainder of the season. I don't know if there's going to be any more moves. I don't I don't think so. If there is, I wouldn't expect any, any real impact players. It would probably just be for depth. And the window is, is coming to a close. It's, it's winding down, so... I don't think you can, you're going to see much more movement from Inter Miami in that regard this year. As for next year, I don't. I, I haven't heard yet. We haven't gotten to the, that point where in, where you know the team's looking that far ahead. But they're going to probably have to do something with Pellegrini, right? Like I know there's a, there's a roster rule change where now teams can have three DPS as well as three players that are below 22 that can kind of fill in this young DP type of role. 22 they, this year. That, so that, that that rule's being brought into the fold, so that will help maybe Inter Miami be able to bring in more talent, more top-end talent as well as young talent, and maybe that'll help them keep Andres Reyes, and they'll be able to sign him to a deal that maybe fits in that category because he's on loan. So... There's there's plenty of things to discuss in, in terms of going forward. I don't, but again, just I, this year I don't think you're going to see much more movement. I think these these questions will be answered at a at a later date once the season get closer to the end of the season and once the season wraps up and, and Inter Miami has more information to to assess where they need to address things and, and what they need to to fill. Okay, the uh, Agudelo question. I think we've we've answered what he can bring to this team, uh, and I don't see any reason why he can't continue. Uh, to get better and better. I think. Uh, I think. Yeah. Yeah. I think. I think he's gonna. I. I, I don't know if you're gonna see a ton of goals from him, but I think you're gonna continue to see good, solid, team first performances from him. I think he really feels something for this club and for this city, and I think that that is good. That shows itself on the field, and he even said it. And I should have mentioned this before. He said it during his press conference. He put in so much work defensively in that second half of the game against Atlanta United, where where Inter Miami was just chasing the ball the, the majority of that of that, that that those forty five minutes. And he said it so he said he defended so much and chased the ball so much that at some points he didn't even have that much energy to attack. So 
like it shows like who, who, how he's playing right now, what he feels, and I think it speaks volumes to, to where he's at right now um, with regards to, to what he's willing to, to put forth for this team. Commitment, commitment. And by the way, it's J.R. Reed and not J. Reed. J.R. Reed, 11. Come on, Eric. Uh, get the, it right. Get it right, brother. Get it right. Uh, the, the next question comes from Slade O'Brien, which is Slade O'Brien. That's like the name of a prize fighter. Uh, <laughs> sounds, like a, uh, sounds like a drill sergeant, man. So this is a question from Slade O'Brien. I think this is his first question ever. So thank you for listening. Do we know when Gonzalo's first, ooh, first name already? Just uh, first name basis with Gonzalo Higuain. <laughs> Do we know when Gonzalo's uh, first game uh, available will be? We've, we've sort of answered uh, that question. So let's focus more on the second one. Any plans for limited fans in the stadium anytime soon? So I've talked to people within the club to get a sense of if it's a possibility. And they're still hopeful. And they're still trying to make it happen at some point this season might happen towards the end of the season, but they want to have fans in the stands. And with the COVID numbers decreasing in South Florida, I think there's there's a, there's a good possibility that it can happen. And hopefully, like I said, that it will happen because like I saw in Orlando and the passion that was there just from a section of, of, of Inter-Miami supporters, even though Inter-Miami CF Stadium won't be full when it does open its doors, having just you know 5,000 Inter-Miami fans will be that much more incredible because if those few hundred fans could could make that much noise and and bring that much passion imagine what a few thousand can do and how that can spur the team on so the team's the team's trying to make it happen i know that the team's trying to figure that out and obviously it's not just it's not up to them it's not solely or strictly up to them it depends on what's happening in 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 the in the market so but i think that there is a possibility and i I, maybe i'm being optimistic but i think it will happen i think that they will open their doors before this year's over and fans will be able to get into the stadium to see the team up close and personal once again. Yeah, numbers going down in the United States, uh, although a few spikes, numbers going down in Florida. But I think it's worth noting that at one point uh, we had, what, 9,000 cases a day or something like that. So it's down to the to the uh, two, 2,000 or 1,000. Still worrying, but definitely the 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 trend is going in in the right direction and and I agree with you I think that at some point before the end of the year we will see some fans allowed in the stadium and that's a good thing if and only if they follow the rules they wear their masks and they are properly separated I saw a a picture on Twitter that's become a meme and I think the you saw everybody I think it's a, at a Clemson football game everybody sitting in these vertical rows and uh, the person who posted the tweet wrote do people not get covid when they're sitting vertically so i I think there needs to be some really smart uh organizing on the part of any club that opens its doors uh to to fans it's yeah i mean i get it i get it and absolutely you have to be responsible but at the same time you know in, in in soccer and football there's passion and that sometimes can can make you like just think not not think as clearly and some Inter Miami fans did get in trouble at the Orlando City game. Some 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 fans were ejected from the stadium because they didn't have their masks on, or they were sitting too close, and they had too many people in in, in a small in a section that they weren't supposed to be in. They didn't necessarily have tickets for that for that area, but the passion drove them to to, to, to just be there and be excited. So. I get it. Yes, absolutely. They, they like that needs to be driven and, and try to tell fans, hey, if we do open doors, you got to be responsible. But at the same time, you know, you like you gotta also there's gotta be some type of leeway. You can't just kick someone out just because they they're not they maybe put down their mask because fans were apparently allowed to pull down their masks to drink beer, which makes for this 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 you know this gray area of like so you're allowed to pull down your mask if you're actively drinking beer. I think those are the words that are used for that rule, but not to like support or not like so th- th- it's, it gets it gets tricky there. But yes, fans need to be responsible, but there also needs to be some. Some some leeway, some understanding that hey, if you're gonna let them drink beer, then all right, maybe maybe you know, also give them a warning or two about their masks before. Well, but that, that brings you... up. Look, I think the point that you bring up about the the gray area is an interesting one, right? If you're pulling down your mask to take a sip of whatever, I mean, use a straw or something. Figure out a figure out a solution because I I get it, but but you know what? I don't buy this whole like oh, you know, fans get passionate and and so. You know they'll want to freaking hug each other and 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 dance. I I get that. Who doesn't want to do that? But at the same time, you have to realize the times that we are living in. You have to be a rational human being, and you, you know, 
for what it's worth, for the people who are doing the right thing, you're ruining it for them if if they do open the doors and they do bring fans in and people are doing the right thing, but you've got a small group who could then potentially ruin it for, for, for everybody else. Listen, if you're not following the rules and if the rules are clear, clearly stipulated, then you should get your ass kicked out of the stadium. And you know, you know what? I not only, know, man. Not only know, well, man. well, this is my opinion. I mean, you've shared yours when it comes to this. And I'll tell you what. And if you do get your ass kicked for not following the rules when it comes to a pandemic – I would also say you're not allowed in the stadium ever again. Maybe that's a little bit extreme, but I would say maybe a few months so you can figure out just how serious things are because unfortunately it's not serious it's not serious enough. And I know that seems harsh, but you know what? It's just not As everyone are, sees it the same. It's like this this, this topic yeah. and we're getting away from soccer and we're getting away from the, the point of like well, what the show is. Correct, correct, but like but now this has become a, like there's different viewpoints on on this, right? So some people think it's it's they don't, shouldn't have to wear a mask unless they unless they want to like that. And that's just how some people right. some feel people about it. Some people think the earth is flat. Well, too, but that's just how right? okay, th- that's how some people feel, right? They don't feel yeah, that they should be obligated. Not, right, but that doesn't matter, right? That doesn't matter, okay? And we, we don't have. We then, the, don't then have, the rules need. Then the rules need to be black and white, right? They need to be. Very, they need to be very clear. There's no. They can't. They can't 100%. You can't also want to sell beer and have people wear their masks, but not wear their. Then like right. the rules need to be crystal clear. And Absolutely. say, hey, if you break these rules, then you're out. But no, no, none Absolutely. of like le- remove this this shade of gray that's confusing for fans, and it just this adds this like this level of complexity that just doesn't need to exist. Because then that's 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 gonna like, right. that, that, just, that, room, just right? some, that just makes a mess of it. So it's the wiggle room. Black, people, make we, it black or white. Make it black or white. We that's, know, that's all we I'm know that we know that people don't follow rules unless they're strictly I- I- imposed or if they're clear. So I agree with you 100. percent But all you have to do is look at what's happening in Europe. Uh, okay, in countries like Portugal, in countries like France, in, con- in countries like Italy, countries like Germany, some of which were absolutely devastated by COVID, you have fans in the stands wearing masks, doing the right thing. And you know what? It's working because they're following rules. I agree with you. Make it black and white. Know exactly what is allowed and what isn't and let people be punished if they don't follow the rule. Passion, I love it. You know what? I'm a huge I'm a, I'm a huge supporter of sporting in Portugal. I'm a huge supporter of the national team. And when they do things that make me happy, I scream and rip my T-shirt off and and cry. All right, Hulk you know? <laughs> but, but you know what? It's going to be different in, in COVID. Not that I can watch uh, sporting uh, in, in person. But uh, let's let's end the show on a good note. Uh, and say this we hope you and I that they do open the doors and get fans in this in those stands and support Inter Miami because that's all that people have been waiting for right no team has been more brutally affected by this than Inter Miami right before three days before their their home kickoff the league uh, sus- is suspended so um let's hope it happens. All right, final thoughts, Franco, real quick from you. They've got two games, the New York Red Bulls on the docket and then the Philadelphia Union on this weekend. Finally, we get to see them play some different opponents. Feels like they've played the same few teams um, over and over and over again, which has obviously been by design because of, the, of the, the, the nature of the season. It'll be interesting to see them and see how they fare against these different opponents. Luis Robles will play his former club on Wednesday. It'll be he, He's going to speak to the media tomorrow. I'm sure the question will come up and... and how he's gonna feel if it'll be emotional probably will be but definitely let's 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 see how Inter Miami does against different teams and how they how they stack up the in these next two games to get a, a better idea of where they really really stand because at this point even though the record's better they've beaten uh, they've beaten Atlanta who's going through a, through a tough time they beat Nashville who's a fellow expansion team and obviously they beat Orlando City one side of three games so let's let's see what Inter Miami can do in these next two matches to get a better idea and a more clear picture of, of what they're capable of and especially if Higuain can get some minutes probably not but you know something to keep an eye on one of the positive things about uh, Inter Miami playing Atlanta United playing Nashville and playing Orlando uh, over and over again it just it, it really does give you that feeling of a rivalry these teams now know each other they don't like each other and that bodes well uh, for the future. Before we end, just a reminder that you can uh, get up to date with all things Inter Miami on various social media platforms. Franco Everyday Updates, uh, Twitter or Instagram with some little nugget of information. And if you're lucky, you get to see insects flying into <laughs> YouTube, his... man. What? YouTube too. YouTube's grown a good YouTube bit. YouTube as well. Yeah, yeah. YouTube's you... grown a good bit since the Iguain stuff and since I've pushed out a couple of videos on that. So 
Uh, YouTube's definitely something I'm putting more more effort and energy into as well as, as Instagram. I mean, obviously on all social media platforms, but YouTube and, and Instagram are probably the top two that, I, that, I'm, that I'm really trying to drive and, and, and push right now. Uh, I think there's there's a, a clamoring for, for information on those on those platforms. So stay tuned. There's more to come. I've done some Spanish stuff. Me and Eric want to get at some point to do a video together on YouTube if we can come together or if Eric can get out to the stadium at some point, his schedule, <laughs> his schedule permitting. We haven't seen each other since March, so yeah, it'd be Right. It'd be good to see your, your mug besides on, on the television. So yeah. a lot it's of things well to come. For, a lot of things to come. It's done well for it's done well for uh, for our friendship. And don't forget to leave <laughs> reviews for the podcast on uh, iTunes. So um, tell me if you disagree with me about COVID <laughs> in, in, in review. So until next time, big soccer.